Welcome back. A, a great episode of Pursuit and really succeeds in uh, creating this uh, feel, even without too many characters of this uh, idyllic uh, English village. I really do like the uh, portrayal of the vicar in the situation. Um, of course, there is a secret, and there's a reason for him wanting kill, but there's not some dark, sinister um, thing that uh, he's done, which, you know, I, I think uh, would probably be where they, uh, this type of story would go today. Um, but, you know, in today's uh, modern mysteries, kind of a te- tedious, so that makes this actually uh, really refreshing. And adds to the feeling of realism of the whole story. Well, that will actually do it for today. Uh, we will be back tomorrow with Pat Novak for Hire. And then join us uh, next Monday for another episode of Pursuit. In the meantime, send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter or Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham, signing off. In just a moment, we'll bring you Pursuit with Peter Black of Scotland Yard. But first, a brief word of interest to all of us. You know, many great men have attained the highest office in our land, the Presidency of the United States. Can you guess the name of this man? He has been called the father of American democracy. As a young man, he was a scientific farmer. And his work as an outstanding architect had a marked influence on both American and English architecture. In 1800, he and Aaron Burr received equal votes for president. And the House of Representatives, under the influence of Alexander Hamilton, voted this man in. One of the most important acts of his administration was the Louisiana Purchase. As president, he also outlawed the dangerous Alien and Sedition Act, and encourage the pioneering of the West. If you don't have his name by now, here are two more clues. He devised the decimal system used in our coinage and invented the dumbwaiter elevator. Who was he? Thomas Jefferson, third president of the United States. His life is part of your American heritage. And now, pursuit. A criminal strikes and fades quickly back into the shadows of his own dark world. And then, the man from Scotland Yard, the famous inspector Peter Black, and the dangerous, relentless pursuit. When man hunts man. With Ben Wright starred as the famous inspector Peter Black of Scotland Yard, we bring you tonight's story, Pursuit at the Vicarage. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Is the vicar in? Who shall I say is calling, sir? Uh, Mr. Black from London. Won't you come in, please? Father's expecting you. No, thank you. If you'll wait in the library, sir, I'll inform my father. Thank you. Who's at the door, Joyce? Uh, Mr. Black from London, sir. 
in the library. Oh, see that I'm not disturbed. Yes, sir. How do you do, sir? You are Chief Inspector Black. Uh, I'm Mr. Monkson, because he'll show How do you do? How do you do? Sit down. Thank you. So good of you to come all this way. I trust that you didn't find the journey too tiring? No, not at all, Vicar. I'm so glad. Of course, you know that it was at the bishop's insistence that he notified your commissioner. I was told that. Mind you, had it been my prerogative, I should never, never have brought the police into such a matter. Well, I'm afraid, sir, that I've not been informed of the nature of the case. No. No, certainly not. No one must know. Even the police here in Ilsham. That is the reason for the secrecy. Do I make myself clear? Uh, not exactly, sir. Oh. Well, then, where shall I begin? Well, perhaps, The uh... beginning. The beginning is the most important part of the work. Well, then, Inspector, the beginning is that someone is trying to kill me. I assume it is for you to determine who can. <laughs> The night before, I'd received a call from Commissioner Harkness. An old friend of his, the Bishop of Saxmundham, had wired, begging the assistance of Scotland Yard in a matter of the utmost importance. Nothing was added beyond the request for a man who would, until the proper time, remain anonymous. The whole thing was rather unofficial. No particulars, no local police authority. Simply the petition for a Scotland Yard man to call upon the vicar of Hilsham, a Mr. Horace Monkton. I had left London at nine o'clock from King's Cross Station, and at a quarter past three, I was sitting in the vicar's study. He was a tall, ascetic-looking man with thick eyeglasses slightly askew, giving him an appearance of perpetual surprise. And now he looked at me inquisitively, his long neck stretched out, the rest of his body folded like a friendly concertina in the chair. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. But I fancy, Inspector, it is for you rather than me to be his instrument in this matter. I think I understand now, sir. I thought that you would. Will you tell me what has happened? Not very much, I'm afraid. No letters, no mysterious telephone. Simply a bullet which passed uncomfortably close last week. And three days ago, another, which removed my hat. So where did this happen? Let me see. The first time was Sunday a week ago. I was taking my afternoon walk with the dog. I believe that it was in the big meadow. We call it Bottle Tea. And then... Here you saw no one? Not a soul. Uh, I, I'm sorry, sir. Go on. My hat. Uh, uh, that was the... Today is Tuesday. Yes. Uh, Saturday. Three days ago. Uh, my hat. I had paid a call on old Mrs. Oakway. It was while walking home that the incident occurred. I must admit that I was angry. Then my daughter suggested that I put the matter to the police. Instead, I thought it best to speak to the bishop. I see. The bishop takes it quite seriously. Quite. Well, it may be just as well to do so, Vicar. But you understand that no one must know. I begged the bishop to insist on that. You are Mr. Black, an old friend who has been kind enough to pay a visit. Nothing more. May I ask why, sir? I was afraid that you would. Well, you see, it's awkward, but there is a man in Hilton. He might be suspected. Why? Two years ago, I was instrumental in having him sent to prison. A terribly unfortunate affair. Poor soul is an habitual drunkard. In his inebriations, he took to stealing. Uh, I caught him one evening in the church. He had been warned. There was no choice for me. You had him taken in charge? Yes, I wrestled with my conscience, but yes. Do you think that he is responsible for these attacks? No, no, at least. I'm not sure. But if it were known, don't you see? Because of his past, he would be persecuted. Has he threatened you since he left prison? That too is unfortunate. He believes that I am responsible for his sad lot. He has made a, a rude remark in part. Threats, Victor? No. No, I should not refer to the Mr. Threat exactly. Uh, would you mind repeating one or two of these uh, remarks? Um, oh, yes. He has suggested that I am a bloody old meddler. Forgive me. Uh, that's quite all right. A ruddy hypocrite, which, sir, I am most certainly not. Then the other day, in passing, he said, I'll pay you out someday, just to uh, What is this man's name, please? Thomas Quinn. But, Inspector, you must not judge him too harshly. The man is so terribly unhappy. I cannot think that he would do me any physical harm. Well, we'll see, sir. I suppose you must. 
Uh, is there anyone else? Anyone who might... Inspector, I am not a blame this man. If there are others who hate me so much, I am not aware. I try to live according to the test. If thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. That may be just the point, sir. I finally convinced the vicar that I could do no earthly good remaining in his house as his anonymous friend. And with the assurance that Thomas Quince would not be unjustly accused, he gave me permission to make myself known to the local police. However, I did promise to keep the purpose of my visit to Ilsham from the rest of the village. Declining his hospitality, I put up at the village inn, and then went to see the police official in charge of the district, uh, Sergeant Bennett. He was horrified when I explained the object of the interview. I never knew. He should have told us at once. I know the man responsible, Inspector. Thomas... Quince, yes, exactly, Sergeant. And that's why the vicar didn't want it brought to your attention. He doesn't think that Quince is guilty. But who else? Nobody would hurt the vicar. You don't know this village, sir. There's not a man, woman, or child who doesn't think the world of Mr. Monkton. Except for one. No. Vicar's being too kind. Leave it to me, sir. Uh, just, just a moment, Sergeant. There may conceivably be more to it. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to look around a bit before we make any arrests. Very well, sir. Seeing you're my superior in Scotland Yard, I can't very well say no. That's good of you. Of course, it's uh, not my place to say so, sir. No, please do. But I think you'll save yourself a lot of time if you let me bring in Quince. We'll get the truth out of him. No, I made a promise to the vicar, Sergeant. Uh, you wouldn't want me to break it, would you? The way he wants it, sir, then I'll be happy to carry out your orders. Oh, that's excellent. Now, will you tell me where I can find Thomas Quince? Ah, where he spends most of his day and night. The white peacock, Guttling. Oh, I see. Well, thank you, sir. If he gets nasty, give us a ring. We know how to handle him. Yes, I'm sure you do. And I will. I strolled back to the White Peacock, which was where I would stay. The bar room was like many other old inns of England, aged with a warmth and the mustiness of wine and wood. It was still rather early, and only two or three customers were there. But as I entered, there was a sudden quiet, born of curiosity. One man, however, didn't turn. He stood at the bar, a great hulk staring moodily into a tanker before him. What's your pleasure, sir? Oh, uh, Guinness, please. Yes, sir. Lovely day, sir. Yes, delightful. Are you staying with us, sir? Yes, for a few days. You'll find it very comfortable upstairs, sir. He was, sir? Ah. Oh, uh, you might ask the other gentleman if I may. Oh, very kind of you, sir. Boys, uh, Guinness? Oh, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, sir? I pay for me old. Oh. Here now, Tom, there's no need to get... Oh, that's quite all right. Quite all right, is it? I didn't ask you for anything, did I? That's enough, Tom. Did I? No, I can't say that you did. All right, then, all right. I pay for me own. Give me another, Thatcher. You've had enough, Tom. Enough! Out, 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 that's all. Out or I'll call the police. Call him, call him, I'll be better off. No, call him, call him. Oh. No language, if you please, Tom. Go home and sober up. Oh, pay for me Sorry, sir. Bit of a problem, Tom Quince. Yes, I understand. Oh, he's all right. Gets into trouble now and again, but he's all right. Bruised, though. Tom's not a happy man, sir. Never has been since I've known him. That was my introduction to Thomas Quince. That same evening, I put through a trunk call to London and Sergeant Moffat. Next morning, I was having breakfast when Moffat arrived. He joined me, and I gave him the details. You think he's the one, sir? No, I think there's more to it than that, Moffat. That's why I wanted you to come up. Uh, you'll have to keep an eye on Mr. Monkton. He won't like it, but that can't be helped. All right, you are, sir. And uh, what about the local? Well, there's a Sergeant Bennett. I gather he resents outside interference, yeah. sir. You'd better stay out of his way, Moffat. I will, sir. Uh, he's all for hauling up, Quince. From what you say, he may have the idea. No, you haven't seen the man who heard him. I don't think he's the one. Oh, Thatcher. Morning, Sergeant. That Scotland Yard fellow here. Oh, yes, Sergeant. Oh. Oh, something's happened, sir. Something bad. The vicar? No, sir. Tom Quince. He's been shot.
You know many great men have attained the highest office in our land, the presidency of the United States. Can you guess the name of this man? He has been called a lawyer by profession, a fighter by choice, and a politician by force of circumstance. And he was outstanding in all three fields. In 1788, at the age of 21, he was appointed public prosecutor for the region which is now Tennessee. As president, he was the first to introduce the National Convention for the nomination of presidential candidates. During his campaign for the presidency, his opponents attempted to smear him by an unwarranted attack on his wife, Rachel, who never recovered from the ordeal and died just before her husband's inauguration. If you don't have his name by now, here's one more clue. During the Battle of New Orleans, as Major General of the Army, he accepted the help of the pirate Jean Lafitte. Who was he? Andrew Jackson, 7th President of the United States. His life is part of your American heritage. Now, the second act of Pursuit at the Vicarage. He was on a hill, other end of Wattles Lee. It overlooks the road. Mr. Petrie saw him, waiting with a gun, when the vicar came along, taking his morning walk. Uh, what was Mr. Petrie doing there? Oh, rabbiting. Uh, lucky for us, he saw Tom Quince raise the gun. He shot him before Tom could shoot vicar. Thomas Quince had been brought to the home of the village doctor. When we got there, a constable stood guard outside the office. There were three other people in the waiting room. Mr. Monkton... His daughter, Joyce, and a third man, a Mr. Julian Petrie. Muffet, Sergeant Bennett, and I went into the doctor's office. Dr. Grove, this is Chief Inspector Black. Uh, how are you doing, Inspector? Uh, doctor, uh, what about Quince? No, uh, not serious. Bullet caught him in the shoulder. Uh-huh. He was in some pain and gave him a sedative. Asleep? Uh, I don't think so. Now, I'd like to ask him a question or two, if I may. You see no harm in it. I've already charged him, Inspector. He's under arrest. All right, Sergeant. In there, sir. Through the alcove. All right. Quince. Yes. Why were you going to shoot the vicar? Uh, you're the one who tried to get me into trouble last night at Point Peacock. I'm a policeman. Hang me, what's it matter? Why did you do it? I did not. You were going to fire at Mr. Monkton. No. According to the man who shot you? Well, pay him out, too. The first I'll see justice done. What do you mean? I mean what I mean. Mm-hmm. Well, if you're not guilty, why don't you explain? Well, I don't need nobody to take my side. I'll pay. That's all. <laughs> We left the wounded man and went to the village police station. First, I examined Thomas Quincy's gun. Then, I wanted to obtain a complete story from both Mr. Julian Petrie and the vicar. In Sergeant Bennett's office, I listened as Mr. Monkton, his daughter Joyce standing by his side, told me of the morning's events. I've taken the same walk on the same road every morning since I've been here, Inspector. Uh, digestion and uh, meditation. Huh? This never would have happened if Daddy'd listened to me. I told him it wasn't safe. My dear Joyce. I am a creature of habits to forego my morning walk. That's unthinkable. You're rather fortunate I was on the spot, though, we can. Yes, yes, it was, Mr. Petrie. Uh, Mr. Petrie, you saw Quince raise his gun to aim at the vicar. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, I was afraid to call out. I might have fired from the shock of hearing my voice. At the time, there uh, seemed nothing else to do. I'm only glad that I didn't kill him. Uh, have you heard of the past attack on Mr. Monkton? Uh, not until today. Sergeant Bennett told me. I think it's terrible, Daddy. If you'd only told the police, this never would have happened. Quince would be locked up where he belongs. The and... law is good if a man uses it lawfully. Oh, Dad. You must be dead now. There's no use sermonizing. Oh, I think, Miss Monkton, that your father has made a rather good point. However, there's nothing much more I can do now. Uh, uh, Sergeant Bennett. Yes, sir. You seem to have been right. I was wrong. Well, sir, we all make mistakes. 
It's kind of you to help, though. Not at all. You are returning to London, Inspector? Yes, yes, I am, Dick. Oh, well, before you go, I do wish that you and Sergeant Moffat would have lunch with us. Well, we, we, we'd better move along, sir. Thank you very much. We said our goodbyes. The village policeman puffed up like a righteous pigeon with an extremely annoying pinch to my ego. Moffat and I walked back to the inn. His face was like a thundercloud. I'm afraid that Moffat's weakness is me. Right or wrong, black or white, black is right. Train leaving at two, sir. Really, Moffat? Yes, sir. Hmm. I'm afraid we'll have to miss it. Oh, sir? I have a call to pay. Uh, you make some excuse to the vicar, but go to his house and stay there until I come back. Yes, sir. Uh, we're, we're not finished here? No, ma'am. Not yet. I didn't think so, sir. I didn't think so. My Lord Bishop, very good of you to spare me a moment. Not at all, Inspector. The matter's of the utmost importance. You've learned something? A man has been arrested. However, I don't think that he is the culprit. Oh? I shan't take up your time with particulars, beyond saying that I made an examination of the suspect's gun. There was a cartridge in the chamber, but the bullet had been removed. Really? The condition of the barrel would have made it improbable for the gun to have worked, even if a bullet were used. More than likely, the whole thing would have exploded. And I think that the suspect knew that. A blank cartridge, though, could explode harmlessly. And the vicar is still in danger? Yes, my lord. Uh, I must ask you a question, which it may be impossible for you to answer. I shall do my best, Inspector. Has the vicar done anything in his past uh, of which you are aware, and which may be the answer to these attacks? Not exactly impossible, Inspector, but difficult, difficult. May I put it this way? I have found that... It is impossible to categorize people. Man is not a murderer because you think he looks and sounds like a murderer. Servant's not a servant because one sees what one wants to see. Therefore, the vicar is not a good man because he's a vicar. Mr. Monkton is virtuous because he's Mr. Monkton. As a man, he's made a mistake. So have I, so have you. But... None, I think, to call for an avenging death. Yes. Uh, he's unmarried now. I, I, I didn't... A think widower. He... Mrs. Monkton died three years ago following a motor car accident. Oh? When did that occur? And where? In uh, York. Very tragic thing. Tragic. Mr. Monkton was driving. A woman darted out in front of the car. He tried to avoid her, but smashed into a lorry. The woman was killed instantly. Mrs. Monkton survived for six months. No charges were pressed against the vicar? No, no, no. He was entirely innocent. Several witnesses testified to that. Mr. Monkton has never driven a car then. Hmm. Can you tell me the name of the woman who was killed? No, I'm afraid I can't. But the vicar... No, I'd rather not ask him. And what was the date of the accident, my Lord Bishop? Mm, I'm not sure exactly. Seems to me it may have been about this time three years ago. That would be in... August 1948, wouldn't it? Well, I am very grateful to you, my lord. No, it is I who am grateful to you, Inspector. The vicar's a friend. He does his best for the people of Ilsham, but I am selfish enough to admit that were the villagers and the church to lose him, they would feel the loss no more keenly than I. <laughs> I left the bishop and caught a bus for the city of York. And there, with the aid of that excellent police force, I obtained the information I needed. The woman who had been struck by Mr. Monkton's car was named Edith Manning. That was her maiden name. She was divorced. However, her ex-husband had been present at the inquest and, according to witnesses, extremely distraught. I felt this to be odd in that the couple had been divorced for six years. Inquiries established that soon after the accident, the man had left York and gone to Ilsham. I carried his photograph with me back to the village. I... I don't know what this is all about, Inspector. 
I thought you said... Yes, I did, didn't I, Sergeant? But you see, I've had a change of heart. Well, I have. Uh, Quince, you all right? What do you want? Uh, inspector wants to talk to you. Alone, if you don't mind, Colonel. Oh, 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 yeah. How's the shoulder? What's the matter to you? Well, if it makes you feel any better, I don't think that you tried to kill the vicar. Well, that's as may be. But you know who has been shooting at him, don't you? I'm not saying. You saw him do it once, didn't you? Maybe. You put all the blame on the vicar, don't you? It's his fault. Nosing around. Let me put in quad. I'll leave a man to himself. Well, I hope the next time is done for. Do you? Well, then when you had a chance, why didn't you do it yourself? Why did you use a blank cartridge? Well, I was just playing at it. Why did I give him a fright? Huh. Will you give me the name of the man you saw shoot at the vicar? No. Have you anything against Mr. Julian Petrie for wounding you? No. Well, suppose he'd done right. Oh. Well, then you think about Mr. Moncton. Perhaps you can realize that he did right, too. I telephoned the vicarage and had Moffat bring the vicar to the police station. Sergeant Bennett sulked, for which I couldn't really blame him. And 15 minutes later, we were again in Thomas Quincy's cell. Bennett, Moffat, the vicar, and myself. The big man lying on his cot glowered at us. Good evening, Quince. I trust you're feeling better. I'm all right. Splendid. You will be up and about in no time. Vicar. Uh, have you heard of a woman named Edith Manning? Manning? Oh. Yes. Yes, of course. I'm sorry, sir. No, no. It's perfectly all right. These things cannot be put away and forgotten. Um, I have a photograph here. Have you ever seen this man before? Yes. Yes, of course, he, but... He was once married to... Edith Manning. Oh. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't forget your face, Mr. Monkton, at Edith's inquest. Sergeant Bennett, I'm so sorry I didn't realize that you... We were going to get married again. We made it all up. And then a week before, a week before the day, you came along. Bennett, I couldn't believe it when they told me at the station. You were on the York Force, weren't you, Bennett? Yes. I'd seen people like him driving glasses half blind. Shouldn't be allowed. And then, then he killed Edith. I'm sorry. So sorry. You're sorry. They don't touch you. It was all her fault. She's dead and they let you go. Well, I swore I'd see that you didn't get off. I got a transfer here. Didn't you think he'd recognize you, Bennett? I didn't care. I was going to hound him, make him suffer. Why did you wait so long? I don't know. Maybe it was worthwhile looking at him and knowing any time I wanted, I, I could do him in. Why didn't you shoot to kill? I, I wanted to frighten him first. And so when I came here, you decided to put the blame on Quince. Well, I, I shouldn't have done that. That, that was wrong. Uh -huh. Quince knew it was you. He saw you fire at Mr. Monkton. I saw. Bennett, would you have killed me? Do you really hate me so much? I don't know, Mr. Monkton. Perhaps I'm sorry now, or perhaps I'm not. I don't know. Mr. Monkton refused to prefer charges against Sergeant Bennett. However, I had no choice but to take him to York and turn him over to the authorities. I have heard that Thomas Quint still resides in Ilsham. He regards the vicar with a jaundiced eye, but no longer utters rude remarks. Pursuit. And the pursuit is ended.
We invite you to join us next week at this same time when Pursuit will bring you another dramatic story of the famous inspector Peter Black of Scotland Yard, relentlessly hunting down those whose disordered passions breed violence and murder. Another story of man hunting man when we bring you Pursuit. as the famous inspector Peter Black of Scotland Yard has been a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Welcome back. A, a great episode of Pursuit and really succeeds in uh, creating this uh, feel, even without too many characters of this uh, idyllic uh, English village. I really do like the uh, portrayal of the vicar in the situation. Um, of course, there is a secret, and there's a reason for him wanting kill, but there's not some dark, sinister um, thing that uh, he's done, which, you know, I, I think uh, would probably be where they, uh, this type of story would go today. Um, but, you know, in today's uh, modern mysteries, kind of a te- tedious, so that makes this actually uh, really refreshing. And adds to the feeling of realism of the whole story. Well, that will actually do it for today. Uh, we will be back tomorrow with Pat Novak for Hire. And then join us uh, next Monday for another episode of Pursuit. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter or Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.